a lot of the what we're trying to do with this community is make app development really seamless. And in that spirit, we have Conrad from PowerSync. These guys are doing amazing work trying to get you to do SQLite sync across all your applications. Uh, over to you. All right. Okay, so uh, today I'll be talking about local first state management using PowerSync. So um, the intersection between local first and state management is a, a topic that um, some other folks have touched on in their talks here at the local first meetups before. Uh, but it is a domain that um, is rapidly evolving, and uh, I figured it's worth it, worth it for me to focus on in light of parsing. Um, before I get uh, into that, I just wanted to give a quick introduction to myself. So I'm a developer who, in 2009, along with uh, my co-founder, Ralph Kistner, um, founded a company uh, which came to be called Journey Apps. Uh, Journey Apps is a rapid uh, app platform. So the reason why we started the platform was that we were in touch with a group of entrepreneurs who had partnerships in place to build enabling tech for community healthcare programs in sub-Saharan Africa. So there were uh, various software use cases around uh, programs for endemic diseases, which required a ton of customization of data models, workflows, and business logic. So that became the genesis of the platform. And uh, we had our first uh, customer who provided the, the real world testing ground. Um, and a big aspect of the platform from the get-go was that we needed a bi-directional data syncing engine capable of dealing with relational data. So um, the apps built on the platform were going to be used primarily in environments where users are offline or have poor connectivity. Um, it is a multi-tenant platform. Um, every tenant schema is unique. So, um, And in most use cases, each tenant has too much data to sync to all mobile clients. So we had to solve um, dynamic partial replication. So we built the syncing engine in a generic and dynamically configurable way. Uh, using SQLite on the client side and MongoDB on the server side. And then we expanded um, our customer base and found success with large industrial customers, um, mainly because of our data syncing capabilities. So those customers um, have workers who often uh, work offline in remote areas and so on. And um, there was a, a talk earlier where um, Neftali talked about boring offline first. So I would say boring offline first is actually a good way of summarizing what Journey Apps has been doing for, for the last 10 plus years. And of course, there's a lot of overlap between offline first and local first. And um, we uh, aspire to bring parsing um, over time closer and closer to, the to all of the local first ideals. Uh, but this has been um, a very good trial by fire. Um, it has helped us mature our core technology uh, because of the need to keep track of various aspects of equipment production and human labor on a large scale. There are many um, complex use cases with scale in these industries. And over the years, we've had many people tell us that they would be interested in using just the sync engine that we've built. So they wanted to include it in their own app stack. So that prompted us to spin off PowerSync as a standalone product. Uh, we've always been um, focused on SQLite on the client side. Um, and we decided to focus on Postgres on the back end because it's so ubiquitous and because the prominent sync engines that we were aware of um, at that time were seemingly mostly focused or all focused on NoSQL, such as CouchDB, PouchDB, and Realm. So with that introduction and background, um, let's get into the meat of, of the topic. So I wanted to start by focusing on just the aspect of doing local first state management with a SQLite database on the client side. So it's no secret, of course, to anyone here that more and more web apps are already using SQLite um, through WebAssembly, and that's definitely bound to grow significantly. Um, in this talk, I will focus on React, but the same principles will apply to, to most other frameworks. So. With React, regardless of which state management framework you use, um, you typically have this one-way flow of data between state actions and the view. So the view, so the page and components, is rendered from the current state and then re-rendered whenever the state is updated. And the view can trigger actions, such as button clicks, for example, which update the state. And there's various differences between um, the state management frameworks. Um, on a high level as well as granularly in each of these different parts of the data flow, but on a high level, the kind of broad principles uh, apply. So if we instead use a SQLite database for managing state, the data flow is, is very analogous, as you can imagine. So we store the state in um, the application state in a SQLite database. Actions become SQL statements, so insert, update, or delete statements or more complex transactions. Um, reading the state is done using a reactive use query hook, which automatically updates the results whenever the underlying data changes. And in other um, frameworks than React, you would use the equivalent to this um, hook. For example, use query might be a, a watch or subscribe API instead. So once you have that architecture in place, you get um, sort of the full power of SQLite for your state management. So the state is automatically persisted across page reloads. 
Uh, the database handles change detection for us. Um, we can use plain SQL queries and views to filter and transform the data as we like. And uh, we can use fast local queries to load any data from any component. Um, and uh, I think I'm, I'm preaching to the choir here. I think a lot of folks are familiar with these benefits, but it's, um, you know, once you implement this, it's, it's really kind of a, a, um, a light bulb moment to see how, how this uh, sort of transforms state management. So we can look at a, at a practical example here. So I'm going to take the trusty example of a to-do list app that manages lists of tasks. And in this example, we're showing lists on the left and tasks in the selected list on the right. And then the list on the left uh, also includes a counter of pending and completed tasks for each list. Um, and the idea is that those should be updated as soon as you toggle any task on the right-hand side. So then to create, um, delete, or toggle tasks, we can use simple SQL statements. Um, this is what would normally be actions in a state management framework. Um, they become simple writes to the SQLite database. And then for our task query, we use a simple select statement with a where clause uh, using that uh, reactive hook that we talked about before, uh, which automatically updates the results when the, when the underlying data changes. Um, these code examples assume the use of parsing. So you will see the hook here is called use parsing watch query. I'll say more about that in a minute and talk about other equivalents as well. And then for our lists query, uh, we also use the use query hook. And um, because we have the power of SQL, we can, you can see that we can easily do things like subqueries and aggregations, um, such as counting, which you can see here. Um, and that's basically all there is to it. So whenever, you know, once you have this wired up, whenever a task is added or removed or toggled, the tasks and the list components are automatically re-rendered with the latest state. So it should be clear how state management is, is fairly simple in, in this paradigm. And um, yeah, so I wanted to talk a little bit more about the use parsing watch query hook, because that's, of course, at the core of what makes all of this possible. Without that, um, you would need to keep track of when queries are stale and need to be rerun, which would increase the complexity quickly. So this um, kind of API is, of course, not directly part of SQLite, but it's built on top of functionality that SQLite already includes. Uh, specifically, we use the SQLite update hook. Um, that fires a notification whenever a row is inserted or updated or deleted. It does provide the affected row ID, but in the parsing implementation, we only keep track of changed tables. And then the SQLite explain keyword. So if you give it a query, um, it tells you which tables are read to produce the results. And um, that works with anything from uh, simple select statements to complex joins, subqueries, views, or common table expressions. So combining those two, we can rerun a query whenever data in one or more of the underlying tables have changed. Um, and it works with practically any SQLite query. Um, it is worth noting that this implementation does do more work than what is strictly required. So in our to-do list example, um, the tasks query will be rerun if, even if only tasks in a different list are modified. Um, but in practice, um, SQLite is so fast that it doesn't matter for most use cases and uh, you, you already get large benefits from, from the simplicity and flexibility of this approach. So we focus on the PowerSync implementation here, but the same concepts apply to some of the other sync solutions. So for example, Electric SQL has use live query. Um, it parses the query in JavaScript to get the underlying tables, uh, which does impose some limitations. For example, um, it doesn't work for views, but it does cater for the majority of queries. And then um, CR SQLite uh, slash Vulkan has use query, which uses the SQLite tables used function to get the underlying tables for the query, which is similar to, ex to the explain keyword. Um, it has a more stable API, but it's not available in, in many SQLite builds by default, since it has to be enabled using a compiler flag. So in our examples so far, we've used plain SQL, which um, should be fine for you know, developers already familiar with it. But one disadvantage, um, of course, is that it doesn't give you any type info for autocomplete or build time error checking. So to handle that, we can use something like the Keasley Query Builder to get type queries and results. Um, it is slightly more verbose in some cases, but it does give you full TypeScript type checking for the query parameters and results. Now, um, we don't recommend using um, database queries for any and all types of state. We generally recommend using queries higher up in the component hierarchy and then passing down the results as properties to components lower down. Um, this allows us to load the data efficiently for multiple components in a single query. So in the to-do list example app, you'll, you saw that we had a single query to load all lists and their associated task counts using subqueries instead of an individual query for each list. Uh, for things like um, transient local component states, such as um, the name of a new task as the user is typing it, you can use React's use state. And then once the user saves the task, you can, sa you can save it to the SQLite database. Um, for navigation states, such as the current page or currently selected list, you can use root properties. 
Uh, for transient global state, you could use a temporary database, uh, you could use React to use context, or you can minimally use uh, state management frameworks. And uh, that should typically be a, a small part of typical apps once all your persisted state is in the database. Um, so loading states and waterfalls is, is one area that um, is worth solving. So you know, with the asynchronous nature of database queries, there can be a flicker on the first render of a component. So uh, it can render, it will render the results once before, or sorry, it will render once before the results are available, and then again after loading the results. And then uh, and the other associated problem is um, waterfalls. So when multiple components in the hierarchy each load their state, that can lead to a waterfall in rendering. Um, and if you're retrieving uh, data over an API, that can introduce significant latency. So um, when you're loading from SQLite, uh, individual queries typically take less than a millisecond to complete. And so we can run dozens of queries sequentially between two rendering frames. That does reduce um, the waterfall problem, uh, but there can potentially still be flicker. So what we've been working on is using React Suspense for this. Um, it's 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 a quite a, a decent solution so far. Um, with very minor code changes in the app code, you can render a fallback component, um, such as a loading spinner. You can also use React Start Transition or Use Transition, which will let uh, React keep the current components until the queries have loaded before rendering the new components. And that's often just for a single uh, frame. So it uh, gives the appearance of loading the state instantly. We have a POC example here. Um, I included this GitHub link here. That's a PR on the PowerSync JavaScript mono repo showing how Suspense will, can work in one of our demo apps. In the React docs, you'll see that the suspense, suspense only works with Suspense-enabled data sources. So in that PR, in that draft PR, um, we make our use PowerSync wash query hook Suspense-enabled. And um, the next step is for us to determine how to roll that out, for example, by publishing it as an alpha version or making the suspense-enabled reactive hook available separately. So um, in the examples so far, we've worked only with uh, client-side state, uh, or sorry, with the client-side database. There's no consideration of server-side state. So that's the next logical thing to look at is synchronizing with server-side state. Um, and of course, there are uh, multiple off-the-shelf solutions available now to keep the SQLite database in sync with the database on the server. Um, using sync layers such as PowerSync or Electric SQL or um, CR SQLite slash Falcon. And that obviously, ha that certainly has huge advantages, which I think many of you are already familiar with. So of course, no individual API requests needed to read data. Don't have to worry about caching and cache invalidation. And the application or site can work fully offline. Now, um, this talk is specifically about how you would do all of this with PowerSync. So I wanted to take a minute to explain how PowerSync works. In um, some of the other local first web dev presentations, uh, it's always interesting to understand the design objectives and design trade-offs of each solution. So I hope, I hope that this is useful in that sense, um, seeing kind of how we architected parsing. So I'm gonna start on the Postgres side. So parsing connects to any Postgres, as long as you're able to um, enable logical replication. It doesn't make modifications to Postgres, so it is loosely coupled to Postgres. There's a, you don't necessarily, for example, have to use the same schema on the client side and on the server side. You can transform the schema. Then there's the PowerSync service. It connects to Postgres, reads the logical replication stream. And then um, in the PowerSync service, you define declarative sync rules, what we call sync rules, which control dynamic partial replication. So the sync rules are grouped into data buckets, which allow sharing data uh, between users where applicable. Um, the buckets can use parameters from the user's JWT authentication token. Um, in the sync rule definition, um, the developer can then write a set of SQL queries that can retrieve additional parameters from the database as well as retrieve the actual data um, to be synced to users. And then the other major component of PowerSync is the set of client SDKs. So there's currently SDKs available for um, Flutter, React Native, um, Web, and then we have Kotlin and Open Alpha. And then once you include the SDK in your app code, um, there are a few things to wire up. So you define the schema of your local SQLite database. That can be automatically generated from your sync rules, uh, which in turn um, references your Postgres database. So you can automatically generate that. Um, then you have to wire up a function to fetch a JWT token from your backend, uh, which the PowerSync client SDK can then use to authenticate against the PowerSync service. So PowerSync assumes that there is some kind of backend with an API that exists independently of it. Um, with that JWT token, the client SDK can then connect to the parsing service and is able to start syncing the relevant buckets of data to the local SQLite database. And that data is kept in sync in real time when the app is online using HTTP streaming. And then the last thing that the developer has to wire up is a callback function that persists writes uh, to their Postgres data database via their backend application. So we wanted to keep the developer in control of how writes are applied to Postgres via their backend. 
Um, in that way, PowerSync only requires read-only access to Postgres, and it allows the developer to apply their own business logic, fine-grained validation, um, or sorry, fine-grained authorization validations, those kind of things, um, to to the writes. Um, and the PowerSync client SDK will queue writes and then attempt uh, attempt them using the callback function defined by the developer. So that means that if the user is offline, writes will retry until a network connect connection is available. And then from here on out, um, the developer can just read and write to the local SQLite database um, using the capabilities such as the reactive live query hook to update the UI in real time. So Parsing does use a server authoritative architecture, so it doesn't use CRDTs in its protocol currently, uh, but for fine-grained collaboration, you can store and sync CRDT data structures using Parsing. Um, and then after a write is processed on the back end, it'll be replicated to all clients and they'll all converge to a consistent state. Um, the parsing client SDKs are open source. The parsing service is currently a hosted service, and um, we uh, uh, it's currently closed source, but a free source available self-hosted version will be released within the next couple of months. So taking a step back and considering state management on a high level, um, yeah, using SQLite for state management is a relatively new approach. Uh, there's more work required to cover more use cases, higher data volumes, low latency rendering, and performance in general. Uh, but I think this is going to be a rapidly evolving area in the next few months, and we're going to see some really interesting new tech um, that will increasingly, um, you know, potentially even displace uh, a lot of the state management framework functionality. You know, even right now, it already works for a pretty large share of use cases. And it's, uh, you know, when developers start developing with local first paradigm, they, they often observe that it's a nice benefit to this architecture. Uh, there was a developer in our community who recently tried out PowerSync, and he made the following interesting observation. He said, back in the days of building web apps with forms and whole page reloads, we mainly wrote code that worked with SQL databases holding state in the back end with useful properties like asset transactions. Now with modern web apps, there's been a Cambrian explosion of different approaches to managing state and each library and framework has its own flavor and mental model. With Watson SQLite and local first sync layers, isn't it great that we can go back to just working with a SQL database that holds our state? And uh, yeah, that's a wrap. So um, I could be reached on uh, reached here and uh, you can find parsing at parsing.com. And um, yeah, thanks for listening.